Hello and welcome to the Bravo Outsider Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Midwinter. Joining me, as always, is birthday insider, Dylan Ferguson. Dylan, happy birthday. Oh, thank you so much. You know, um, I, I do have a special announcement to make. Can you can you play that uh, clip, Craig? There's somebody my birthday who can say it is a than really big deal to my birthday. My birthday. Birthday. My birthday. My birthday. My birthday. <laughs> my actual birthday. For my f***ing birthday. It's my birthday. It's my f***ing birthday. Because I was born today. <laughs> it's my 25th birthday. You can't leave. It's my 25th birthday. It's my birthday. It's my birthday. It's my birthday. It's my birthday. Not on my birthday. My birthday dinner. My birthday party. I mean, I know it's Stassi's birthday, but for God's sakes. This is my birthday. For the love of God, treat it like it's my birthday. My birthday dinner. My birthday. Jax, is this your birthday or is it my birthday? It's like it's my birthday. Yeah, so this friend of the show, Stassi Schroeder, thank you so much. Um, I just had to get the, the queen of birthdays in there because... Uh, that's how I'm going to treat this whole episode. It's it's my birthday. I'm going to be horribly entitled, and I'm going to throw a fit <laughs> if anybody contradicts me. I am really glad that you sent me that clip because I was like rushing before the show to get ready, and I really wanted to get a clip of Stassi talking about her birthday. So I'm glad we were on the same wavelength because she is the birthday queen. Yeah, the patron saint of, of <laughs> overselling your own birthday. So I'm going to be going Stassi mode all day today. Well, each week we bring on someone who doesn't follow Bravo, make them watch the episodes and get their take. And joining us today is the very funny Tyler Katowski. Hey, 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 hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do all my line? Do I do my line now? My housewife yeah. line? Okay, yeah. check this out. If slashing faces is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Marlo's in the house. <laughs> yeah, right on. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Really stoked to yeah, have amazing. you on the show. We always start things off by getting our outsider to just give a little background and what sort of previous experience you have watching reality TV. Yeah, okay. So I'm like an OG reality guy, so I'm more like a survivor, like competition-based reality oh, show yeah. guy. But uh, my wife recently got super into Vanderpump. So I, I'm oh, a little bit right familiar with the multiverse. Like uh, uh, <laughs> Stasi is unfortunately in my lexicon now, uh, Jax, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm a little bit aware, but these were all new people to me. Oh, yeah. So what are what are your impressions of Vanderpump? Like the what you've caught of it, at least? Um, I, I guess it's probably what most people feel about these shows, which is like, I hate everyone. And <laughs> yeah. I, I need to see more of them. Yeah. <laughs> Everything they say is crazy. Uh, and the things they don't say, the things that aren't crazy, you're like, maybe he's got a point. And then he doesn't, obviously. But yeah, it's the best. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's dive right into things. We're going to talk about Real Housewives of Atlanta, Real Housewives of Orange County, and the final part of the Real Housewives of New Jersey reunion. Were any of these episodes in particular like... Did you find one of them more compelling than the others? Uh, yeah, I mean the New Jersey reunion was definitely a banger. Oh uh, yeah, because because you're getting a lot of info, at least for me, where I'm I'm parsing things together. They all look the same, the husbands especially, actually. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, I don't know who is linked up with who here. Um, so that that one was pretty exciting. You can usually tell by who they're sitting behind, with one exception, which is Frank, who's just kind of adrift in the yeah. in the middle there. Yeah, he, he seemed like he was lost. What I yeah. liked about the husbands is there was one guy that said nothing, I think, the entire episode. Oh, who is that? <laughs> Nate, maybe? Nate didn't really um, talk to the old The oldest one, maybe. Oh, uh, Paulie, maybe. Oh, no, Joe. Joe ben Benino. Yeah. 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 Uh, not, not Joe. What's the other guy? Gorga? Not Gorga. Great name. Yeah. Great yeah. name. <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> For like a Jersey meathead being named Joe Gorga is just yeah. so on the money. Yeah. It makes me think of the, the Mortal Kombat boss that has like eight arms, Goro. I don't know why it makes me <laughs> And they all have visibly high blood pressure is what I noticed. Oh, yeah. Those husbands. Yeah. All those guys have vessels that are like just about to 
go full on geyser yeah. rupture at any moment. Very puffy faces. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the combination of like roids and alcohol and pasta that really does it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It the Holy Trinity, it. as they call yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Every week they've also got Andy riling them up or whatever. So that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The one thing that like Joe Benino, Marge's partner, talked about was like Andy just asks him. It's like, oh, are you glad that uh, Marge's cast is off so that you don't have to wipe her ass anymore? And he's like, yep. <laughs> and that's that's all his contribution is. Yeah, this reunion. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely seem the most normal is the impression I got of that couple. That they seem just kind of like, why we don't know why we're here even. Yeah, I think like um, that's definitely different from the season, but I can get that out of this reunion because they haven't been featured. And one of the things that like um, kind of left me feeling a little unresolved from the Real Housewives of New Jersey reunion was that it was so focused on this conflict between Teresa and Louie and Joe and Melissa that there was really no space to talk about the other stuff that was going on in this season. Like, uh, Jennifer Aiden had such a, a strong story this season that really didn't get touched on. And, uh, you know, Marge is always very active and that didn't really get touched on. So it was a little disappointing that we didn't have more space to to talk about that. But there was obviously just so much content and it was such a heated conflict between uh, Teresa and Melissa that there there just was no space for it. Yeah, is there more? Is that going to be like two part or is that that's it? The reunion and then that's the third part of three. So that's the final part. There was two previous reunion episodes before this. And everyone was kind of waiting for the husbands to come out just because Joe Gorga is Teresa's brother. And so that's a really heated relationship. And this introduction of the Joker in the deck, uh, Louis, (laughs) is... Um, something that people are very like fired up about. And he is um, a, a well-loved character, I would say. <laughs> yeah, he rocks. <laughs> Which is, It's great that Joe Gorga actually says to Louis, you look like the Joker in this episode, because on the show we've been saying <laughs> that for weeks now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that he has like a thesaurus full of kind of like subtle ways to threaten people. Not even yeah. subtle. He's just like <laughs> sitting there muttering threats for most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Watch, watch out. You better watch your one day. Just someday, a matter of time. Soon. Just yeah. a matter of time. You're going to get yours. Just like sakes it like that the whole time. Like, I don't think and he's got this that. like hired like group of thugs via Bo Deedle. Bo yes. Deedle is a great name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have they ever shown him? Have we seen Bo Deedle? Not on screen, but he's like popped up doing instagram lives and okay. commenting on things and i think calling joe gorga a little bitch boy or something like that <laughs> which is the m- one of my favorite terms that gets flung around in in new jersey uh it, it was a label first applied to joe gorga and then it was melissa turned it to be louis is the new bitch boy and now bo Deedle's firing back that actually joe gorga is the bitch boy so Dang. if you're following along at home jo- joe gorga is still the bitch boy that's like a <laughs> Kind of like a New Jersey slur now. It's like you really don't want to be the bitch boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've got their own full lexicon in New Jersey. Like, you know, you can't call someone a rat. You can't call someone a bitch boy. Yeah. Yeah, you got But you can careful. call someone a, a booga wolf. <laughs> <laughs> now that's fair game. <laughs> yeah. It was... Uh, uh, I, no, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, what what were your first impressions of uh, Teresa and Melissa in this this conflict? I thought they were both great. Yeah, like coming from the Vanderpump world a little bit. Like I said, I was like, oh yeah, get after it, go go nuts. Uh, I, I what I appreciated is I pretty quickly kind of like put together the context of like, okay, her her maybe like ex husband went to jail, so did she. Now she's blaming Joe. Great, put it all together pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I thought they were both stupid though. I definitely did want to hear from other people. Like you said, like I, I got the picture. I was like, great. You don't like each other. Let someone else talk. Let's hear from the guy that looks like uh, Dave Batista a little bit. The guy with like the super chiseled yeah. uh, facial hair. <laughs> I liked him a lot, but we oh, yeah. the only time we heard from him was when he was like, I got the proof. I got the proof. And then he just, yeah. di- he kept holding up this, this dossier, but then I don't think he pulled anything out of it ever. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was just like, look at it. 
Look at it. It's just full I, of jelly beans. It's I love how many <laughs> manila envelopes there were in this reunion. Yeah. Like everyone had one tucked behind. Yeah, it was <laughs> awesome. like waving around it's and like no one opened theirs. Up in here. <laughs> they kept handing them to Andy as if he was the bailiff. And it's like, this like <laughs> who's he going to hand those to? Like, it's just, yeah. There's no I'll, judge. You're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would have been great uh, if I what... just pulled out some reading glasses and it was like I'm just going to go through these documents <laughs> yeah. for the next two hours <laughs> objection overruled <laughs> I, I like that the new guy uh, is definitely the healthiest looking husband when they were like how'd you like your first year or first season oh, or whatever yeah, Nate, I was like yeah. oh that guy looks great he's gonna give him five more years of hanging out with those guys and then we'll see (laughs) that's exactly yeah i'd like to see his his teeth in five years i'd like to see his hair (laughs) it's being a on on one of these shows ages you more than being president of the united states like you know how you always see those like before and after of someone after their term in office and Yeah. yeah definitely like being on these shows will will weather you yeah. And also fill you full of like plastic and fillers and <laughs> stretch yeah. you out. <laughs> I would like to see Real Housewives of the Oval Office. That would be good. Yeah. Well, oh, there was a Real Housewives of Washington, D.C. And it got canceled after like one season. But the uh, a, uh, a couple on the show, they crashed the White House for some, some <laughs> event on it. I actually haven't watched that series, but... Um, it's kind of just like a legendary uh, moment in Housewives where they they crash the White House That's uninvited. Excellent. That is yeah. excellent. <laughs> that kind of sums up the hubris of these people, generally speaking. That it's like the yeah, president, the president probably wants to see us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what What were your highlights from this episode? Okay, I really liked when they uh, <laughs> they they kind of did like the husbands partying uh, montage where they're like, oh, these guys party, these guys drink. Uh, and like Tums was was heavily featured. Yeah. It was like, oh, like they didn't have to show them bringing out Tums, but they did. I yeah. like that a lot. <laughs> um, and then I like just Andy's kind of lack of control over any of them. It's yeah. been like multiple dozens of seasons across all shows, and he still can't get control for thirty seconds. Yeah, he, he normally does like a pretty good job of kind of like moderating and and being impartial but in this case it was just so fired up that he had to be like a like a a preschool teacher trying to control (laughs) control these people yeah it was awesome when one of the husbands was like andy can i say something and he was like i don't know man (laughs) that's not up to me guess we'll see (laughs) yeah and uh yeah i also liked when he was like "I i don't sleep in your dead husband's pajamas or whatever. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Yeah, it came out wrong. But then he explains it and he's like, but I did do that once. Yeah. <laughs> right. it, it was his sweatpants, actually. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, it wasn't, why would he, it's so funny. Why would he even phrase it as pajamas? Like, was he trying to be more like empathetic and like that's more of like a a nurturing pant to wear (laughs) yeah well this whole season we have seen louis try to be this like he's tried to be this like zen guy that is kind of mediating things and moderating things and this was like the tail end of that where it just really was not working for him and he like joker pilled himself and just (laughs) like became this really aggressive like trying to be this mafioso type character that is running things and threatening people it was a real like heel turn but everyone kind of saw through his original persona it was really interesting because he was just so awkward about trying to be this good guy it was like uh vincent d'onofrio's character in men in black where he's like (laughs) the alien that's in human skin and just like kind of like awkwardly maneuvering things that was louis trying to be a good person he definitely has like a like a devilish vibe to him like you could see where like that guy would play the devil on some show somewhere (laughs) yeah what's great about this episode is that we get to kind of see both light-sided louis and dark-sided louis in the same episode because he comes out and starts trying to do his like conciliation therapist thing and start being like okay yeah i want to hear your side of the story yeah it's okay let them speak but then like within like 15 minutes is is back to just being like let's play your day is coming (laughs) soon (laughs) soon literally just (laughs) threatening everybody for for the rest of the episode (laughs) and then ends it off by being like let 
now I want to shake your hands. Like, yeah. like, okay. <laughs> shake your hand. I want to shake yeah. your hand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got he, to see both sides in sometimes like instantaneously where he was like, yeah, let me shake your hand. And then when the guy's like, don't talk to me, he's like, well, screw you then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love when Marge brought up his uh, his warrior tattoo, his uh, his chest piece. <laughs> And he's like, damn right I do. Be careful of me. Like He's <laughs> right. very empowered by this tattoo yeah. that he got. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I have a tattoo on my chest that says, I am a mountain lion. Like, Look out. <laughs> I believe it to be true. So yeah, be careful. Uh, what other highlights did you have here? I liked uh, at, at the end of the episode when, uh, when she's like, at the end of the day, the show's about us being friends. Yeah. Is that what the show is about? <laughs> that's not... I just watched the episode and that's not the vibe I got, but yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that that's what they fall back to at the end of the day, that they are still like, we're friends and that's what this is about. Yeah. Like, maybe I just don't know friendship. I don't know. <laughs> and then she uh, ends on the, a long convoluted quote about like, if you cheat, then then if you drink, but and if you kill, then you gotta laugh. Oh or yeah, no, Dolores like, oh. like reading off a terrible wedding <laughs> yeah. speech from her phone. What a perfect <laughs> summary of like this long convoluted <laughs> quote. Or at the end, they're just like, drink? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that was something she prepared. I think she just punched something into chat GPT and was like <laughs> just reading it as, as it was coming out. That's what I should have done. I should have had chat GPT write me a, a housewife tagline. <laughs> I thought she was just like maybe texting Polly, like, give me like an, an Irish drinking quote or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Polly's got a weird vibe too. I don't know. I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, he, he does. I think like... It might be that he's got a personality that just doesn't come across on camera very well. I think yeah. Shane on Real Housewives of Orange County is also similarly like he comes across as just like like an asshole, just but he's got a really dry sense of humor. Right. Um, whereas, yeah, Polly is just very uncomfortable on on camera and um, very stiff. Yeah, and sometimes the editors don't know how to play that guy like with certain characters you you can see how they make cuts and edits to like frame certain things but with some guys they just don't know how to do it so they're just like look at him yeah here he is <laughs> i think paulie's best moment was when they're uh they're arguing about pizza gate as joe insists on terming it <laughs> yeah and and Polly just like says to nate like oh, i want pizza now and it's like yeah me too and then at the end of the episode they bring out pizza after they've left poor Polly and nate <laughs> don't even get the pizza <laughs> <laughs> that was the most tragic the part face. of this episode yeah that was a very unusual way to end things and i wonder if they ordered pizza after like in the studio one of the producers was like oh we got to get pizza now like we have to order some <laughs> some pizza to end this on because they usually do their like toast or their shot or whatever to end the season and the reunion yeah um and they ended with irish whiskey and pizza and i i thought that was fun and very awkward to watch these women who are very dressed up kind of maneuver this this pizza in a way that like <laughs> seemed somewhat yeah. graceful but it's yeah. like you're eating a slice of pizza so how how elegant can you be yeah i like to i like to think production was like uh, uh hold on it's actually not bo deedle's security it's just the pizza guy yeah Send him up. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i don't know why he told us he was security he's just got pizza <laughs> he said he was his name was dom <laughs> oh, Domino's. Oh, <laughs> that's my bad. That's my bad. Yeah. <laughs> I assume that was like a reference to the Pizzagate thing. They decided to do that as a prop, but it, it yeah. did come off very like uh, 2010s Oscar telecast gimmick. Or like a, like a Jimmy Fallon style, like, hey, we got everybody eating pizza. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> it's yeah. the biggest selfie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, did you have any other highlights from Real Housewives of New Jersey? I, I did note that uh, without like any contacts on my end, at the start of the show, he kept asking the husbands how they're feeling. He's like, how you feeling? You good? You good? And I was yeah. like, are these guys, are they unwell? Or like, what is the... <laughs> and it turns out, yeah, just they all kind of have something going on. Yeah, yeah well, he, he literally says to, who does he say, to, to Louie or something, Louis, he's like, I just yeah. don't want people getting physical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he has a reason to actually be concerned because, you know, those guys might get physical. Yeah, for it's sure. Funny, it's funny that Andy is, like, so concerned, but he's kind of like, he's like the Oppenheimer of, like, he's built this massive thing, but then he just keeps building more of them. 
He's like, I love it. I need more of this. I need one in every state. It, it is really interesting how the like the physical like geography and the um, uh, kind of just the the regional culture infuses a different flavor in each of these these shows. Big mm-hmm. time, big time. Each of the, yeah, like each of them definitely had an entirely different vibe. Like New Jersey was uh definitely the most aggressive yeah and then maybe maybe atlanta and then oc was pretty pretty mellow yeah yeah definitely like that california laid back vibe in this episode that that we got it was not really rife with like head-on conflict on on oc yeah uh dylan what were your thoughts on this finale to the reunion of new jersey pretty satisfying um did nobody ever tell joe gorga that you're supposed to unbutton your suit jacket when you sit down i don't know, <laughs> thought i'd mention that i don't know i'm surprised that he's never heard that before or maybe he just thinks that it, it's tighter around his torso if he leaves it buttoned up but um sorry that has nothing to do with anything just had to bring that up <laughs> um i did like i said i loved louis uh uh journey through a th- through light louis to dark louis and then try to transition back to light louis at the end is so good and love how when people start bringing up all the bo deedles shit and he's like he's like I, no no that's not no no i don't I, what's where's your proof that's not true i don't have anything to do with him and then yeah. they're like oh we got uh, word that you've got a security downstairs no that's somebody bo deedle sent me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right buddy so you're really up with your case here there um <laughs> Sur- surprisingly strong presence from uh john fuda i thought who like we haven't really seen too much of uh yet yeah. to, like to like show up and be like i know i have connections and and <laughs> uh and just like go go straight up like uh, toe-to-toe with louis and be like i know everything you've done which is like talking to louis at his own register it's just like two like vaguely threatening men being like <laughs> being like I know and I will destroy you. No, I know and I will destroy you, which was great. I didn't expect John Fuda to be the guy that like stepped into that role. Yeah, um, it, I think that even shook Louis because he went right to him after and was trying to make things up. And we've talked in the past about how important the the husbands are on Real Housewives of New Jersey, not just like what they give to the show in terms of the entertain entertainment value, but also, they serve a real strategic purpose to the show, and John Fuda definitely, as like a, a first, uh, a rookie house husband, uh, wasn't very active in the sort of strategic social positioning that happens amongst the the husbands on on New Jersey specifically. But I think this was him kind of watching back and kind of seeing how things work and being like, okay, I gotta. I got to step up my game and be a bit more present. So I was, I was happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely tried to ingratiate himself with the husbands right away with the first like initiation dinner where he showed up with like the Tums and like the depends diapers and being like, Hey fellas, here's the lame jokes you guys like. And it would totally work as a huge hit with them. Yeah. This is him trying to ingratiate himself on the other side and being like, by the way, I'm going to be the, the tough guy, Balfio. So uh, that uh, uh, that's expected of me. So um, yeah, a, a little interesting to see that going forward to the next season. So hopefully we see a little bit more of John Fuda and his in his bizarrely sculpted beard. Yeah, on a <laughs> on a note about the sort of the husband dynamic, the strategic aspect of that, um, I was pleased to see that Frank indicated that he has patched things up uh, with with Polly. Um, I think you know Dolores having to husbands in the like the guys camp is a real advantage for her strategically like she's got so much more pull to do whatever she wants when she's got you know two united husbands acting on on her behalf within that group <laughs> the um, united husbands yeah <laughs> and one on each side of the aisle too you got to be able to reach across the aisle That's very yeah important. exactly <laughs> <laughs> um my favorite shot in this which i thought was a beautiful shot was like right after teresa storms off 
and we've got her like talking on her phone to Gia while like production assistants like mill around. And then there's just the screen behind her showing the feed of what's happening on the sound stage where uh, oh, it's yeah. just like Joe Gorga is like just like going off, but silently with no audio. Just like how many layers there was to that scene of like different stories being told to different people on top of other stories. I thought was like just like a beautiful uh, uh, shot that like encapsulates all like the, the the multiple narratives that you get in these kind of things. Uh, and just uh, using that uh, phone call to Gia was like a huge coup for Teresa, I thought, who was mostly getting savaged in this episode, I thought. Yeah. Um, you know, didn't necessarily look very good for most of it, was really like ex- explosively childishly shouting the whole time, which uh, plays into Melissa and Joe's hands. You know, I liked at one point when uh, when when John has the 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 dossier or whatever and, and Teresa's like, I, I'm all about proof. You know, I'm all about proof. And it's like, really, are you all about proof? Because it seems like you're all about like vague insinuations, actually. But uh <laughs> but uh to to use like the uh the idea of 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 picking up on something that that Joe said that Gia said, which was a huge misplay by Joe, and then to actually like call her on the show because that was like such a great uh, play for her because it's been clearly established that children are like off limits and that that's yeah. a line that you cross and and she was able to show like that that joe and melissa have really crossed the line that you're not allowed to cross according to their logic yeah by and, ha- by having Gia yeah her own i think words like, contradict them yeah and i think melissa was definitely trying to position Teresa as the the one that crosses that line in the sprinter van scene that we saw mm-hmm. during the the trip, where as soon as Teresa kind of implies that, you know, uh, I think it was Melania was hurt by Antonia not being able to make her sweet 16 birthday party, um, that, you know, that's something that Melissa jumped on right away and is like, oh, you be that aunt. I'm not going to be that aunt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't think that Teresa was saying or implying anything about Antonia I can see how it kind of would be upsetting but I don't think it was the big deal that Melissa made it out to be um and so now when there's just like such a huge arsenal of examples of Melissa and Joe you know uh bringing the uh, Teresa's kids and involving them um it definitely was a misplay on, on Melissa's part. And I was glad to see that we got this call with, with Gia. I feel like they could have also kind of juxtaposed it with a clip from that sprinter van of, you know, Melissa saying that she's not going to be that aunt, but um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think this was a good, like uh, a big score for, for Teresa on on this when otherwise I think through this whole three-part reunion I feel like it's been mostly a dominant performance from Melissa with just a few missteps yeah yeah I think so and uh and you could see that Melissa and Joe kind of realized that they opened themselves up to 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 taking that blow at the end after they bring it up and then uh, then Teresa immediately jumps on it and starts calling Gia they're both like oh of course of course she's gonna back her mom up I mean of course (laughs) oh god (laughs) like they realize that uh, what they opened themselves up to by by saying that so um uh, so great work by Teresa to capitalize on that in a big way and giving her the reason she needed to storm out yeah, you know, the reason to to be like, oh, a line has been crossed. Now I get to actually blow up and act like I have a, a good justification for blowing up. Yeah, and it was it was a good move for her to storm out in any case, but especially just knowing that Andy might follow her out, just showing how much power that she wields as a housewife. Yes. Because typically, when someone storms off, Andy does not leave his seat. Yeah, but. Uh, for him to come out and, and follow her, that's, you know, that's kind of a, a big deal. Yeah, he comes out and follows her and then he starts saying, like, I'm sorry I was shouting at you. I was getting caught up in the moment. And watching that, I'm like, OK, yeah, her power play worked. Like she's yeah. got like Andy following her and like Andy on her side. And this is totally what she wanted. Yeah, for sure. Uh, any other highlights from Real Housewives of New Jersey? Oh, that, that's about it, I think. But uh, great way to end an awesome season. Such a yeah. fun season. 
Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I, I don't think I've got any other highlights either. I think we covered most of it. The other thing that was uh, kind of funny to me was the montage of uh, Teresa talking shit about Jacqueline Loretta and, uh, <laughs> you know, Andy's calling her out for it being the joke of the century and uh, <laughs> using using the editor receipts. I really love that. Yeah. Um, but let's move on to Real Housewives of Atlanta. Uh, I thought this was a, a fantastic episode. It, uh, the the episode preceding this was really building this up, and I thought that it really delivered. I was surprised to find out that this episode had the lowest ratings in franchise history for Real Housewives of Atlanta. I think people are just really? not paying attention to that series, and I kind of understand why it hasn't had a lot of drama up until now, but I thought that this was a great episode. Uh, Tyler, what were your first impressions of the the cast on Atlanta? Um, there are definitely more, I mean, as far like on the husband and partner front, obviously in this episode in particular, we don't really see them. I think we see two of them kind of briefly and they're both kind of like, huh, so that's what's going on. All yeah. right, <laughs> uh, and, but because obviously the story is is mostly on on Marlo and Candy in this one. Yeah, um, but I thought it was hilarious. They started the episode with like previously on, and I was like, oh great, a little catch up. And then they're like, in 2011. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. We're digging deep. Yeah. So this runs deep. Yeah. Like, they don't care how long you've been watching for. We're gonna fill you in. Uh, and but and even still, like at the end of that first sequence, I was like, okay. I'm now caught up from 2011 to 2023 and I still know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like, I'm no wiser. I, uh, okay. Uh, but definitely I was like, these people are more down to earth. It seems. Yeah. I would say there's like kind of a mix of personalities, but yeah, that intro was something that immediately stood out to me. Um, I thought that it was, not just like great as an introduction for anyone who has not followed this franchise for very long, but also just like this kind of beef tape that you see when you're promoting a big like fight or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. I really loved how it was setting it up and, you know, the tension just building right from the start. Yeah. And then like Marlo at lunch with her, her manager slash friends, they say, which is like, oh, all right, well, yeah. You don't have to say they're your friend. I believe you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that was almost jarring because it was the first time I watched this episode last. So it was the first time in the three episodes that I'd just seen people getting along, just like interacting with friends. Oh, yeah. And, and just talking about their lives. Like, who are you going to date? What are you going to do? Um, so I was like, all right, slapper or like do something. <laughs> like, uh, what are we doing here? Maybe the show is about friendship all the way. I didn't, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> and yeah. Then, yeah. I, I oh, think it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, we got a really good cross section of episodes that we're covering this week. Like we've got the very end of an explosive season of real housewives of New Jersey. Now we're getting uh, a middle episode in a kind of like, mid tier season of real housewives of Atlanta. But, you know, as the seasons of these shows, they progress, they, you know, they exist in certain places um, within an arc. And it's not always a straightforward story arc, but you have a definite like different goals at the end of a season episode versus uh, the middle of the season versus the beginning of the season, like we're seeing on, Real Housewives of Orange County. So I thought this was a really good cross section. Yeah. So like I was maybe halfway three quarters to the episode and I was like, I like everyone so far. Like I almost, I wouldn't watch this again just because they're all succeeding and I, and everyone's nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this isn't great. And then it like really picked up in the back half. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was interesting. Like, I guess I'm kind of lost on the timeline when they were like, showing me unseen footage of Marlo talking about her nephew being shot. It's like, yeah. so we, so we didn't know about this until you're showing us the unseen footage now. Yeah. So it hadn't like made a splash on the show. Like it wasn't talked about because there wasn't really any drama surrounding it up right. until now. And so, I mean, the edit is kind of, 
framing this as though it's something that Marlo's just kind of pulling out of her back pocket to try to right. like have conflict with with Candy. Um, but yeah, so I guess there was some previously unseen footage where they kind of hug it out and talk about this a little bit, or at least one scene between Candy and uh, and Marlo. But yeah, it hasn't been a storyline up until this season. Yeah, that's that's the impression I got. So almost immediately I was like, well, Marlo, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you gotta just let it go. Yeah. Like 11 years ago, she doesn't even remember it and probably rightfully so. She was like, yeah, he doesn't work here anymore. I don't know what to tell you. I think the shooting was more recent. I think the yeah. shooting was like 2020, but yeah, in the their like conflict and their complex relationship goes back all the way to 2011. Right. Yeah, as 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 seen in the flashback. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what were your highlights uh, from this episode? Um, I like I like when they're. Uh, I guess it was Kenya showing off her her new building that she got to set up her business in or whatever. Uh, oh yeah. But no matter, at least for the first three scenes, it didn't matter what the location was. It was just like two people go to this place and then talk about men. So they like <laughs> go into the building, put on their hard hats, and sit down. And then they're like, "So how are you going to date?" Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe ask me about my new business or something like that, but yeah, (laughs) I'll figure out, I guess I'll figure out dating. Uh, And then I was like, let's see this escape. As soon as they were like, we're going to an escape room. I was like, no, they're not. I bet they don't step foot in that room. Yeah. (laughs) So then by the end of the episode, when they were like next week on, I was like, damn dude, I might be watching next week. I got to see how this escape room shakes down. (laughs) I feel like they're not going to show the escape room. We got just like a little bit of a commercial for it at the, at the tail end where they showed the, the bomb going off. Um, I would have liked to see that, that play into the conflict. Obviously Candy just could not keep her cool when she showed up. So um, the confrontation just had to, come right out of the gate uh which i'm sure the producers were a little bit disappointed that it played out the way it would and that it did because there would have been really interesting storytelling opportunities to build the tension between the women while also building the tension with the game so i was Mm. i it did feel like that was a little bit of a missed opportunity but i thought that this fight was um really engaging to watch it would have been great if, like, right when they blow up at each other, the paint bomb blows up, too, and they start shouting and then just gets splattered with paint. paint yeah. Nice. But you can't have it all. Yeah. yeah I, I wanted to see them hell in a cell it up, for sure. That's what I thought. I was like, if you put all of them in a room together, it's going down. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're going to be fighting people they didn't know they wanted to fight just yeah. to get a punch in. Totally. Uh, they- what other highlights did you have from this? Uh, I loved when I love when she was talking to her. I guess I don't know if it's a husband or a partner. I, I'm disconnected, but she's like, you know, whenever I have a surgery, you got to have a surgery. And he's like, I've never had surgery. And she's like, you've had three. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so <laughs> how do you forget you had three surgeries? Well, one of them was brain surgery, so. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. No, yeah, that that, that's not true. <laughs> no, she lists them. She says, what does she say? She says, like, two, like, in the face region or something. And then she says, like, and then the other one. And yeah, then, like, like, picture in picture. And, and they, they, yeah, they do an insert of his crotch <laughs> just to make it clear. I, I love the, the editing choice there. <laughs> the editor's continuing to have a ton of fun putting together Real Housewives with Lana. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. It, it seemed like. And some of the sections, like when they were at, uh, what was her name? Is it Sonia? Yeah. Uh, when they were at her house, I think. And they're just kind of like showing the family dynamic and whatever. And I feel like they were trying so hard to edit it to be like, she's mean. Look how rude she's being to her family. And I was like, I just don't think these editors have ever like just been around black families. Like that's just like, <laughs> she's just interacting with her sister. And they're trying so hard to be like, she's mean, huh? And it's yeah. like, I don't know. She seemed like she was having fun. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, they are really trying to like make this dynamic um, feel like a big conflict when it seems like maybe it's being overplayed in, in the story. But um, I don't know if that's because Sonia is not really giving us much to work with or have a reason to care about her story. But yeah, um, yeah I mean... I think both positions are kind of understandable or all the positions in this family. It's just a, you know, 
Um, Sonia wants to have her own space, and I think that's fair. And yeah, I don't know. I, I do think it was really canny in the editor's part to end that scene uh with uh with Sonya going up to the kid and who's being like oh you know I, I lost my tooth and uh and you know she's like uh yeah well if, you know of course it's gonna hurt because when you're you know you're missing something and you it, it always feels a little weird when something that's always there is missing or something as like a bit of a like a metaphorical oh, reference yeah. to the yeah, member yeah. Of, her, of her families that she might be missing or at least that her sister is insisting that she's got to be missing once they're gone i thought that was a very candy little move to like put a little uh little a little bit of a metaphor in at the end of the scene yeah the perfect totally. type of show to put that sort of stuff in too it's always Absolutely. hilarious when it's like like super dramatic sort of like you, you know it's not high class television and then you get those little moments where you're like nicely done production team yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think like if you watch these shows for uh, a long time and like really focus on them you see a lot more of that than you would expect to see um it definitely does not have the the reputation of having this multi-layered storytelling voice um but it absolutely does like uh like yeah this is a, a great example of that yeah the characters come across like despite it being obviously like uh it's the drama is ramped up and they're kind of generating conflicts constantly where it's like, why don't you guys go for drinks on a boat or something like that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> despite the producers kind of meddling in whatever way they do, the characters all come off very earnestly where you're like, oh, these are just people living their lives in some way. Um, particularly with Atlanta, I found like, I was like, oh, these are just people living their lives and they've agreed to be followed or whatever. That's why some of them are just not as exciting as other ones. Yeah. And this was a really like great episode in terms of showing this, their like personal home dynamic. Like there was a lot of very warm scenes at home where we see like, uh, I'm thinking specifically about like Cherie's scene where she's got her, her uh, grandbaby there and just a really like warm scene. And then, you know, I thought it was a very good balancing uh, dynamic to what happens at the end of the episode where it's just such a heated conflict where there's, you know, it, it's such a heated external conflict. Yeah. It was at that point in the episode where I was like, is this show different than the other ones? Like, is it just nice? Cause everyone's nice. Like the Cairo's baby is cute. He's spending time with grandma. It's like, yeah, this is all adorable, wholesome stuff. Like yeah. now I don't want any of them to fight. Cause I think they're all nice. <laughs> Yeah, and that does, like, it does, you know, definitely uh, color and change your perspective seeing these scenes and, you know, seeing how multidimensional these people are in a way that you don't get in other forms of narrative fiction. Like, you know, typically if you're watching uh, a movie or, um, like, reading a novel, yeah, you've got a lot of examples of multidimensional villains, but there's still like a, a villainy to the core of them. They, they're still always going to be mostly on like one side of the, the conflict just because it's a lot easier to, um, to get whatever point across, like whatever point you're trying to make across um, using you know, people and pieces that represent um, that that represent aspects of the whatever vision you're mm -hmm. trying to communicate. Um, I, I don't think I'm articulating myself well here, but I I think it's just it's a lot less common to have uh, characters that are both you know good and and bad at the same time, and seeing that play out. And being really empathetic towards them in one scene and then in the next scene being like, oh, you're like so out of line and so wrong here. I think that is something that does make it a little hard to get into following uh, mm -hmm. these shows a little bit um, and, and really in embracing that nuance. But it's something that is a totally unique element in reality TV as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so I was just trying to get a pure impression of a person is going to come off like 
less clear and distinct as if it would if you was totally constructed uh like getting the little kid's handprint in the in the clay you know it's going to come off a little weird and mushy but then you need the little, the little producers there to kind of push it back into shape to make sure it looks <laughs> yeah. a little bit more the way it's supposed to <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah cuz cuz ultimately these people like aren't characters they're just people yeah well they're so a combination they, yeah, they of the have... two they're a combination of people and characters yeah, I'm sure they have compulsions to like play things up at certain points and and not play things up at other points, but ultimately they really come across as human, which is nice. Yeah, and they always have to balance that, you know, the character that they're trying to portray and what's going to be good for TV with their real life stakes. Like how are their actions going to impact their reputation or, you know, external relationships with people or their businesses and brands? Um, it's always a balancing act for sure. Yeah, I think like, I mean, in this show, particularly like Marlo kind of talks about it where they're like, she's violent, she's violent. And they show the the replay where she's got like her hands on her hips and she's not really getting in her face at all. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's like, I guess when you got to be careful how you frame things, because she discusses how it's like, I don't want to be this violent black woman because that looks bad. So like, I guess yeah. the producers probably have to be equally careful with how they frame things to to not do that. Because that's not what it's about. It's about the people. Yeah, for sure. And I thought that this was a really... I was glad that we saw this conversation because, you know, Drew has been talking about, you know, how she doesn't use the word shooting or people from Chicago don't use shooting. (laughs) Like talking about, you know, trying to... Trying to frame her actions as being this like enlightened point of view where she's careful about using harmful language but then is the one that is most visibly using like problematic and harm harmful language by constantly referring to marlo as aggressive and threatening and using these terms that are like constantly being used to harm black people and it's yeah so it was i'm really glad that we got this scene of sonia like calling calling that out And you really see how kind of the other clique, like the group that left, you see how they're actually really kind of the parties instigating things when at least, again, the way it's framed by the producers is Marlo's inside kind of being like, it's not really fair the way they're treating me because I'm not a violent person, at least not for the last 23 years or whatever. Yeah. And then they cut to outside and Drew's out there like shadow boxing, like I'd take you down in one punch. And it's like, (laughs) the the vibe is way different inside. So, oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was also really funny to me when, uh, when Drew's, uh, saying about like, Oh, if Marlo gets up in my face, like that old, uh, that old Chicago is going to come back and, uh, and Ralph's being like, (laughs) yeah, I don't know about that, man. Like, I think Ralph says, yeah, Marlo, um, that's a big one. (laughs) Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, With Ralph on this one, I I think if if Drew tried to fight Marlo, I think that she would be on the floor pretty quick. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I loved when, uh, when Candy was like, I'm only crying because I can't choke your ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I could choke you, I wouldn't be crying right now. Yeah. <laughs> but the, it's, uh, the, yeah. the moment where she says to like Kenya, like, don't hold me back, felt so much more real than when like someone like Jax or James does it on Vanderpump Rules, yeah. where they're like expecting to be held back so that they don't have to fight. Yes. Like, Candy definitely seemed like she wanted to fight. Yeah, Candy went into fight mode, in like real fight mode, yeah. like you said, like not like show fight mode, which is great. I love seeing like battle Candy come out. Like the the physicality is is so great in that scene because also let's be real, like Marlo is instigating some stuff too, right? Like she's yeah. not like just like standing around and and she knows what she's doing too. She's pretty catty about that, but she's a lot more subtle in her movements. Like Drew says, yeah. like all she has to do is shift her weight. And that's that's totally it. Like she's she's really good at like just kind of like changing her angle, doing a tap or something, and like setting people off. She wants to set Candy off, and then Candy gets set off, and she's like totally like like fury fight mode. And uh, the clash between like like Marlo's like more like languorous kind of physicality and Candy's like extremely high energy physicality was like very entertaining to me. Yeah, and I think Marlo is a very like very smart and strategic housewife i i thought her um as, when candy comes in and immediately like starts confronting marlo marlo takes her and like let's talk uh 
let's take this aside. And, you know, that's a very like seasoned move. And I feel like she needed to sort of, um, she knew that everyone at that table would probably mostly be on candy side, at least the people that, you know, have the social currency to take a side in this, um, that they would be on, on candy side. Um, so getting this conversation to happen away from the table was definitely the smart move, but she also realizes that, you know, candy is, is smart and it's better that candy won't want to be, um, going one-on-one when she doesn't have to. So she kind of, uh, capitulates and like says, you know, we'll bring Drew over because this involves her so that, you know, Candy still maintains somewhat of an advantage here. Mm -hmm. And she's able to be like, you know, let's, let's talk this out. You can retain a bit of an uh, advantage. And, um, you know, that makes it a more agreeable proposition for Candy to go along. And I, I thought that that was a very like seasoned move on, on Marlo's part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they both like were sort of right. So it was like, the right thing to do to just be like, let's just talk about it. Let's see where we're both coming from. And I think they could easily both just like see where one another are coming from. She can't send her flowers retroactively. Yeah. So just maybe you can apologize and be like, Hey, I was wrong about that. Maybe I should have done something. And then it's kind of just over. Uh, But at the same time, it's like Marlo, it's like, it's such a small thing. It's really not what you're making it out to be, you know? But at the same time, the specific detail is a small thing, yes. But I think, like, we have to take into account that that Marlo is probably still feeling a lot of grief over this. Like, like I mentioned, her nephews aren't, like, uh, distant people she doesn't know. Like, she's taking care of nephews uh, as if they're her own children. Like, I think that it, it should also be taken into consideration that this probably is, that she probably is still grieving because of this. Yeah. And that's what makes this, like, a, a, a really interesting a conflict that they're building off as because it involves something that is like such a, a real uh, deep and, and hurtful thing. It involves somebody's death. When is so many of these conflicts in housewife shows are just built on the stupidest, like somebody said a word I didn't like uh, bullshit. Uh, and, um, and the, the, the reason why she's using this to like go at candy might not be like a, a great reason, but the reason why she would feel anguished and upset is like, the most real reason there is uh you know it's it's actual grief and i think that's what makes this a little more complicated is that it it can be true at the same time that marlo is using this as a tv moment and using this as a reason to start a conflict and that she's also grieving and going through a lot of pain both things can be true like like the fact that she's using this as as fuel for her tv show doesn't make it fake doesn't make her feelings fake and, and that's why I think it's a, it's it's kind of unfair and disrespectful for Candy to later be like going through text messages and be like, oh, look, five days later, she was talking about cameo on text message, like as if yeah. that yeah. proves that she's not like actually grieving. Like you don't get to do that. You don't get to tell somebody like, oh, your grief isn't real because it doesn't look the way that I expect it to based on these text messages, you know. Uh, so I think it was a bad look for Candy, who is a, like I say, isn't without a a, a case here right that in yeah. the sense that she's saying that marlo's blowing this out of proportion uh she's you know she, she's got a point there but it's a bad look for her to then go in the parking lot and kind of seem to question her grief and then also continuously repeat the whole slashing the face <laughs> incident yeah. over and over <laughs> again like the, you've and just that the one thing that one thing from her past they just repeat again and again and again as if to try to make that like marlo's whole personality is also like an unfair uh thing to do so i thought the whole like post-conflict uh argument in the parking lot or not argument but the whole rehashing of it in the parking lot was like very uh a bad look for them and unfair to yeah marlo. and i i don't think that candy's like text message receipts were the proof that she thought it was because the way that I kind of read into the the message talking about cameo was like, oh, there's been five days between when Marlo says, you know, hey, my nephew who used to work for you died. And Candy's like, oh, man, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Then no communication for five days. And so maybe just like she's just wanting to make contact to see if she can maybe extend that like conversation and just get a little bit more out of candy by just putting something lighthearted and unrelated out there like 
you know, oh, hey, like you should check out this cameo thing. Obviously, Candy knows what cameo is because she's a reality star. They're all on there. <laughs> um, so just to be like, oh, yeah, you should check this this cameo thing out. You know, um, she's probably not looking to sign Candy up for cameo. She's probably looking for Candy to be like, oh, how are you holding up? Like, is there anything I can do? Like that's that it felt to me like that was the dialogue that she was trying to get. And um, obviously it seems like Candy didn't pick that up on that. Um, but yeah, that that's what it read as to me, at least. Yeah. And even if she was just trying to get her to sign up for Cameo because she gets a bonus for signing up a friend or something, who cares? It doesn't prove anything. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes actually when you're grieving, it's nice to just think about something that's normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like signing your friends up for Cameo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did either of you guys have any other highlights from Atlanta? Uh, I did really like, uh, I thought Cherie had a really good line when she was, uh, you know, asked the question, like, how's your love life? You getting more than two pumps? And she says, two pumps? Am I a moisturizer? Oh, that was good. <laughs> that was a good one. So you know, props to her for that. That's about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to uh, shout out again to the editors on this. I really loved when Candy is on the phone, it's like, you know, that girl I don't really mess with. And then there's the graphic of Courtney, like laughing with her, like <laughs> job <Yeah. laughs> really reminded me of like uh, a South park. So I was yeah. really <laughs> excited about that. Yeah. Glad to see they're picking up on Courtney's borderline demonic energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, let's talk about real housewives of orange County, the series that started it all. Um, episode two for this season, uh, Tyler, what were your thoughts on Orange County? Uh, I was thrilled. I didn't, uh, maybe I'm crazy, but I didn't know my boy Terry Debro oh, was yeah. involved in this show. So I was thrilled to see him. Big botched fan, yeah. big fan of botched, <laughs> uh, big botched boy over here. I'm a, a botchy <laughs> boy. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was awesome. Uh, I was glad to see that their family's like pretty normal. They seemed like one of the kind of like down to earth type like they're not mixing it up too much which was nice um yeah they they definitely are like not as out there as other uh people on orange county are yeah which is which is kind of not that i expected you know terry to really be an out there kind of guy but nice to see yeah I mean, um, they they are out there in a sense where they're like buying monogram towels for their twins. Dorms, yes. But. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say they seem a little bit more like like almost like obsessive compulsive in the way that they were framing her, where it's like I need this, this, this monogrammed, this, this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, this one was fun. I liked this one a lot. This one was kind of like the drama was there, the the comedy was there, but the stakes seemed very low yeah. for whatever reason. Like, uh, okay, who meets up pretty early on? Tamara and... And Shannon? Yeah, to talk about their friendship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I love when the wasp, they're, they're kind of talking and like a wasp flies in front of her and both of them just like stop the conversation. to be like, ah, ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which again, just kind of shows like, these are real people. It's not like the producers could be like, can you just say that again? Can you start the conversation again and talk about whatever with the same emotion it's like no sometimes a wasp flies in your face you know yeah (laughs) uh yeah in that one Tamara has a great line where she's like uh you've been a great friend to me and she's like sometimes (laughs) like (laughs) it's kind of this offhanded where they're both like we've clearly both been great friends to each other and they definitely agree on that Yeah. (laughs) yeah this was a really great scene this was one of my highlights as well um I think Shannon is really wanting to, you know, to, she sees Tamara coming back as like a potential ally here, but uh, Tamara's, you know, kind of holding fast in her uh, wanting to be a free agent. Like she's not signing a contract (laughs) with the the three Amigas. Uh, She's, she's going to free agency. It was, uh, and there's kind of like a fun sort of foreshadowing here where she's calling her out on her drinking yeah where she's like you got to stop drinking Uh, your husband said that everyone says that you're an alcoholic this this and that and then yeah you get to the end of the show later and she's like screaming wasted on a boat like i'm gonna jump off this boat 
<laughs> I'm gonna go overboard. I really like that that conversation where Tamara's like implying that Shannon is is a drunk, and then immediately after the waitress comes up and Shannon, you can see Shannon being like, "Should I order a drink <laughs> yeah. or no? Let me get uh, uh, yeah. a Belvedere soda, please." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I still didn't even take as like, "Oh, what an alcoholic." I took it almost more as her being like. I'm going to have one right now, in fact, right in front of you. <laughs> I don't like, even know what a Belvedere soda is. So she like definitely threw this out there as this yeah, drink that, that you was. might not know is alcoholic or not. Uh, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a vodka. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so she, she was on the sauce. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's like weird drinking habits. Like there was a, at the pr- the prior conversation when they sit down and they're like, I'll get a drink and a Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. She's like, ooh, ooh, I'll do that too. And it's like, we're so alike. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think she maybe just thought it was a good idea. And well, yeah, they seem to be claiming that it's like a Midwest thing, right? They're <laughs> yeah, like, Midwest so- <laughs> pride. We're drinking a Diet Coke with our <laughs> drink. Yeah. Yeah, that was a whole was weird because she's like, funny. she's like, look, I'm I'm having a sip of each. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. It was so all right. She's like, I'm <laughs> drinking two drinks at the same time, and then she counts like one, two, yay! <laughs> <laughs> I all love right. how I love how like just dorky and awkward these these women are. It's great. Yeah, that's My why I like them. The <laughs> <laughs> Again, it seems like just friends getting along. They're human. They're not like yeah. They're kind of goofy. Yeah. I mean, last week we didn't we didn't even talk about this last week, but last week we saw Emily drinking out of a dog bowl on a hike. Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I it's just like they're relatively normal. You know, you've got to conserve just, water in California. That's that's yeah. smart. <laughs> Legally, I had to do that. <laughs> but they always order champagne. Like we have seen so often them order champagne. Like Emily ordered a, a diet coke and champagne at that. Uh, yeah, yeah, in episode one, happened. they ordered champagne at a bowling alley. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think Tamara and Shannon both ordered champagne at the their lunch too. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I the love, it drink down there. Yeah. I love how they feel like very Hollywood adjacent. Like they're not quite like this real true Hollywood thing. Like the way the one girl's like, "I'm gonna take some acting classes. Can you come with me and give me tips?" Yeah, it's like <laughs> that's what. The class is for. The coach is not going to be stoked if you're like, no, my friend's going to give me the tips if that's all right. <laughs> so it's like they're so close to like kind of being in the real thick of it, but they're not. But so they're also so, funny so to far see away. The way they move. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what's fascinating about it. They're like close to like a big, uh, you know, a, a big world city and like a center of culture. But they're also like so out on the hinterlands in this zone of like suburban sprawl where you see when they do like the montages of like where we are and it's just all identical houses yeah, in these neighborhoods yeah. <laughs> where you have to like you know drive a car for two miles to do anything whatsoever and they're like yeah they're they're close to everything but also so removed from everything at the same time that's what what i was talking about this a little bit in the previous show but it, but it, they develop it even more here and i love that vibe of them just being kind of like a lot of these people from like you know midwest backgrounds and stuff who don't necessarily come from this milieu and come to this this like kind of sterile world of like empty wealth with like no culture out in the hinterland and uh and they're just kind of like living in a world with with almost no culture which i think is great cuz a lot of these shows <laughs> Uh, like Atlanta, New Jersey, and Miami, which we've covered before, uh, they have that great sense of a regional culture. You know, you mentioned that with New Jersey, you've got like this great uh, vibe of these Italian families in New Jersey. Uh, you know, you, you really get to uh, to understand a little bit about like the Southern Black American families and stuff in uh, Atlanta too. You know, often these shows have like this great sense of a regional culture. Orange County has none of that. It's just like yeah. white women in the <laughs> yeah. void. Yeah, uh, that's what you would call the show. Like just just a vacuum of like of like recently wealthy white women who have who are just like milling about in athleisure wear with no culture, <laughs> making some old El, like old El Paso tacos and like unwrapping frozen pizzas and yeah. just like yeah. <laughs> the tacos really stood out to me, too. Yeah, <laughs> that it was like even in Orange County, this mom was like, "Let's do white people tacos. Let's yeah. just get the where you know I get the and then you just put it together yourself." But she has none of the ingredients, so it's just like, "Yeah, it's kind of just meat and beans." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm Especially loving that. Considering vibe. how like great 
Mexican food you can get in Los <laughs> Angeles. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, if you drive several miles, you know, you could you could get amazing food on, it, on any street corner. But here it's like, all right, we'll put the little old El Paso spice packet sauce on the ground beef and that, that'll be it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's fun to see where which they is use good. their Don't wealth. get me wrong. That is, that is sure, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I do love this vibe of just like kind of l- losers at yoga pads just like t- trying to figure out what their life is together in this like vacant parking lot-esque space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're just like bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is this like need that they all seem to have to like define something, like some sort of notable thing about themselves and i guess that is like true of every every series and everyone but they seem like especially needy for it like they don't have this sort of rich culture or you know anything else really they've got enough money where they don't need to really worry about things that a lot of people have to worry about not enough where it's lending them a culture like Dylan, you pointed out last, uh, last episode, but yeah, it's, it's enough where it just keeps them bored. And that's, that's interesting. Yeah. They only have little scraps of regional culture that they brought with them from the Midwest, like drinking a diet Pepsi at the same <laughs> yeah. time you have a martini or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird <laughs> mosaic to that. Yeah. <laughs> All the most bizarre cultures come and become this melting pot of just weird whiteness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like I, oh, Jen's sweater she's wearing that says "I burn sage and bridges as needed" is yeah. like <laughs> the perfect like cringe white woman sweater. I I kind of want one. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's such a perfect <laughs> a bit of like like lame white woman apparel. Love it. That's like a good encapsulation of of Orange County in that like I'm sure she went to like a local store and bought that off a rack there. Like yeah, someone's making sure. money selling sweaters like that there. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Or, or Etsy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys have any other highlights from Real Housewives of Orange County? Uh, I got There's a couple of good lines. Like uh, <laughs> when, when they're talking about doing this flamingo party and the whole thing is just like, yeah, it's kind of like a party in the spirit of the flamingo. <laughs> all right what is that what do they typically just stand on one leg the whole time yeah, yeah they just kind of hang around don't they that's <laughs> yeah okay and then when she, when she mentions a micro fridge and you're like oh that's going to be like a small fridge and then she goes no it's, it's like a fridge with a microwave attached <laughs> what the hell is that <laughs> i don't need that yeah gina was really like when she was putting together this this party theme just really like kind of throwing it out like just not putting any effort into it whatsoever (laughs) and then gets covid and doesn't even attend (laughs) yeah Uh, like you're gonna serve shrimp because flamingos eat shrimp sure absolutely (laughs) yeah i will be serving shrimp i never thought of that but yeah i think there'll be shrimp there i also really love that emily's husband is just like going around telling everybody who will listen flamingos are pink because they eat shrimp you know that was very relatable to me that's the kind of thing i do i thought that was great (laughs) also the kind of thing i do that was relatable to me is chatted being like when they're on the boat like this is often the place where there's seals look there might be seals here yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah she came across as such a like seven-year-old like mom mom look mommy yeah look like (laughs) obviously trying to just like put her her foot in the story that was going on but the way she was doing it was so funny like didn't have a story of her own to tell so she just had to be like is that john's son yeah i think that's john's son out there and then when they confront her 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 apology is i did think it was john's son yeah All right. (laughs) Apology accepted. I also really love the multiple shots they have of women walking up the staircase on that boat, that narrow, dangerous staircase, wearing the worst possible footwear for it, all wearing these gigantic heels precariously 
perched on, on that staircase. It's going to be a miracle if nobody twists their ankle by the time they uh, they get off of that. And um, <laughs> totally, just, yeah, just funny. They kept showing that. They kept showing close to that. Like the production crew, crew know this is this is like a ticking time bomb. Yeah, yeah. they're like, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they're building tension through this. <laughs> yeah, like, I think they're foreshadowing something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, what did what did you think about uh, Heather's performance during during this episode? Which one's Heather? Uh, so Heather is Terry Dubrow's wife. Oh, sure. I thought she's great. She seems like a nice lady. I don't know. Uh, I like her. <laughs> yeah, I um, I think Heather is is likable. I think this is a generally pretty likable cast. Um, I thought so. This is Heather's second season back since taking a, a hiatus. She was on for a number of seasons and then she w- went on hiatus and focused on getting her castle built. And uh, <laughs> now now she's back. <laughs> And I thought that we were seeing her show her like veteran chops in this. She was definitely trying to make sure that uh, Tamara and Shannon do not form an alliance. Like she was anytime right. that they were together, she was constantly like swooping in and uh, literally sitting between them. <laughs> yeah. Literally sitting between Emily and, and Tamara, like definitely trying to isolate Tamara and wanting her on her side and it was like she was playing it off really like casually but to me it seemed like very apparent what she was doing it doesn't sound like any of the housewives have picked up on you know this extra attention that she's giving Tamara. but uh, i thought it was notable to me i'm curious to see how that's going to play out in the season yeah i think that's a really good read i didn't really see it that way but i think that would totally make sense and uh, also like that uh, emily still seems to be acting like she's like the tamara whisperer like she's just approaching her like a wild animal <laughs> yeah. and being, like, uh, I-, I will calm you down and tame you and uh, and heather doesn't really seem to want her to do that yeah for sure and i'm gonna be sort of interested because we've already seen like heather take information that is coming from shannon and you know, feed it to Tamra in a way that is going to position them for conflict. That is, you know, that's, that's smart if you can do it and continuously do it very subtly. Like that's kind of the name of the housewife game. But if people catch on to what you're doing, that's something that can very easily like blow up in your face. So you're going to need to be really careful about it. I am curious to see whether Heather is able to, you know, kind of execute on this strategy throughout the rest of the season. Um, or if she's gonna get if she's gonna get caught for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say that I owe an apology to Gina too. Uh, we were doing tag lines the previous episode where I hadn't actually heard the tank legs yet, and Craig was reading them to me, and I. I, I, I said that I thought that Gina's take line about comparing my past to my presence is like apples to oranges. I thought it was just like weird and like just kind of surreal and stuff. Actually hearing her say it uh, before the episode, uh, it, it clicked to me and I realized that she was making a pun. She's talking about going from New York City to Orange County. That's yeah. the, from the Big Apple to Orange. I didn't, I didn't pick up on that. So sorry, I wasn't familiar with your game, Gina. I uh, I, I see what you're doing there now. And now that I see that it's a little, makes a little bit more sense. I, I want to change my rating. It was a plus before it's just going to be an a now. Yeah. It's gotta, it's, it's, gotta, <laughs> it's gotta be a little fucking weird for me to really love it. So Emily is, is winning the, the, is winning the taglines game right now with her. If you're going to waste my time, at least a little a, bit a, too coherent. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Someone on our YouTube channel on the, the clip that we posted actually pointed that out. And yeah, it didn't okay. click for me either. But yeah, totally, totally makes a lot more sense now. And yeah, yeah she gets downgraded really in the rankings as a result. Yeah, yeah. Be weirder <laughs> next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other highlights from Orange County? The workout montage of Emily that ends with the little dog licking her face and her just being like, <laughs> please stop licking me. Yeah. <laughs> was, was really great. I don't know. Just love that. Uh, I don't I remember who it was, but at some point someone was like, I looked up ghosting. That is not what I did. <laughs> yeah, Shannon says that. I think. They're yeah. like, on a technicality, I did not ghost. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I did reach out. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that about does it for me as well. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Tyler. Uh, do you want to let people know where they can find you? Uh, yeah. So my home address is... Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. You can just find me all around town, man. I'm at Rumors Comedy Club all the time. Doing shows there, all 
around town. Wherever you can find comedy, you can find me in the night. That's uh, that's in Winnipeg for anyone that's not listening. How about uh, online? Yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, I am good and funny comedian on Instagram. Uh, recently paid to be verified, so please make that a profitable venture <laughs> for me. Uh, and yeah, I'm not. Uh, that's really. I'm the same thing on TikTok. If you want to follow me on TikTok, I'm doing little dances. Um, <laughs> right on. Go, I'm teaching nurses new TikTok dances, <laughs> and I'm doing them with them. Uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Dylan, how about yourself? Uh, you can find me on Substack writing about movies, Dylan Ferguson. And it's my birthday, by the way. Just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. Happy that. birthday. I didn't say that. I didn't want to interrupt the intro, but happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you didn't say that, actually. I'm taking over right now. <laughs> I always hate Craig, when the guest... This guy's never coming back on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when the host has to be like that voice you just heard is our guest today. Oh. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll wait till spoken to. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone, send your favorite Stasi birthday clips to Dylan all day Please today. Do. Yeah, he'll love that. Um, that's been Bravo Outsider for this week. You can find us on Instagram at Bravo Outsider. Find us on Twitter at Bravo underscore Outsider. I think. Uh, like, subscribe, and rate us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next week, keep on wifing.